What's up and welcome to another episode of Family Mojo. My name's Kenny and I'm so happy that you tuned in for this week's topic. And it's a tough one. <laughs> okay, what we're going to be talking about this week is the five hardest conversations that you can have with your kids. You guys ready? Strap on your seatbelt. Because some of you, you're going to cringe. <laughs> Here we go. Topic or conversation number one. Sex. Told you. <laughs> Some of you, just even by the mention of sex, you're like, nope, 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 Kenny. I'm not, nope. That's for the mom, mom to do, or you know, they'll figure it out in school. No. <laughs> That's not what we want. And I would say a large portion of the people that are viewing right now, you would agree. Um, Deb and I, uh, a long time ago, you know, when we started having kids, you know, we kind of made this pact that we would err on teaching and talking about things too early rather than too late. Because here's the deal. Like we know that our kids are going to find themselves in situations where they need vital information to make the best decision for them. And if we don't give it to them, somebody else is. And so Deb and I just decided we're going to be the ones. We're going to be the ones that err on too early than too late because we didn't want our kids to be ill-equipped in situations that they would find themselves in. And so the topic of sex, it's a tough one. And ready? It's only going to be tougher the longer you wait. It's going to be awkward. If, you know, if you're trying to talk to your 14 or 15-year-old about sex for the first time, let me tell you something. They've already been clued in and not by you, which means there's probably a lot of uh, bad stuff that they're going to have to, you're going to have to unlearn them. Um, is that a word? Unlearn? It doesn't make a difference. We're going to move forward. You understand what I'm saying? So be the first in all of these topics. Be the first one out. Be the first one that engages and has these conversations with your kids. So the awkwardness doesn't settle in and creep in. It'll just be a part of a healthy, it'll be a healthy part of your family's like routine or, or habit. We have the ability as parents to be the first one, to be the first educators of our kids, especially on such a, an important topic of sex. So go first, talk about it. Because when we do early on, it just gives them permission themselves to engage in that conversation, especially when we're open and honest about sex in our own lives, in our own history. Be honest. Tell them that maybe you messed up. It's okay. That doesn't disqualify you from going, I messed up, but this is what I should have done. You're the parent. Model it. Be the first one to have that conversation with them. Okay, topic Number two, hard conversation number two, it's death. Really, death is, it's, it's hard, it's difficult because it's a natural part of life. Like we were born and the only thing that we know that we can, for me, look forward to is actual physical death. Um, and so we need to have that conversation early on. Um, our kids understand, you know, that it happens, but here's, here's the, here's the key point is that we need to be honest with our kids in this particular situation as well, because most of the times, and this maybe moms, but dads, especially like we hold back our emotions and our feelings because we have to, we feel like we have to be strong for everyone. It's not true. <laughs> it's not. Because what we do is we model that for our kids and then our kids say, well, if dad's not, you know, or mom's not grieving and showing emotions and trying to process it, then I'm not. And then they start stuffing and holding things in. And that's not, that's, that's, that's not what we want. We want our kids to be able to grieve freely and openly and honestly. And the only way they do that is we talk about how we're feeling so that we gives them permission to open up and talk about how they're feeling too. So open up, be transparent, be real. Don't try and like machismo this up and you know, be the you know, person and you know, the excuse is, you know, I have to keep it together for everyone else. No, you don't. <laughs> you have to be honest with yourself and where you're at because again, that gives permission for your kids to be honest where they're at. So have those hard conversations about your feelings and your emotion. 
as it pertains to death. Tough one, but it'll be a good one. All right, hard conversation number three, suffering. And if you spent any time with, you know, uh, teenagers or you have teenagers, um, you know, Deb and I, especially like in student ministry, we get this question all the time. Okay, Kenny, if we, uh, if we serve and we're, you know, searching after and longing after and following after, you know, this loving God loves everybody, why does he allow innocent people to suffer, right? We may have that question sometimes. The, the interesting part is, is that most of the kids that have this question don't have a problem with bad people suffering. <laughs> It's only the good people, you know, and who gets to choose who's bad and who's good. Anyways, um, but innocent people, why does God allow them to suffer? And like the, the interesting thing too is that theologians and philosophers for thousands of years, maybe longer, have had this debate and conversation over why. Why have suffering at all? Well, first part of this is, you know, we can actually look in scripture and there's a book by, you know, it's, it's Job and we, we see a guy in a family and, you know, he's got it all. He's got everything, you know, he's wealthy, he's got his kids, he's got a wife and, and ready? Then Satan enters in and he asks a question and God makes it permissible for him to wreak havoc on this guy's life. But there's a why, like we get the backstory behind that too, because God knows, God knows Job's heart and his character and his integrity. And so he allows because he knows. And we know we, we, if you've read the story, you know, Satan wreaks havoc on Job's life and, you know, wants Job to denounce God and turn away from God and has friends come in and same thing and but he doesn't comes close but he doesn't and then at the end of the story we see Job you know regaining his wealth and family and and at the end of the story true story we, we find ourselves you know like coming to the conclusion that the answer to suffering it's beyond me it's beyond you like I don't have a good answer, but here's what I do know. And here's what we can tell our kids. We can say, I don't know because we really don't. But here's what we do know is that the God that sometimes allows suffering is present and he's suffering with us, that he loves us enough that as we go through a season of suffering, so does he. And for me, understanding that, that I don't serve and we don't serve a God who is disconnected and couldn't care less, that we serve a loving God, that, ready? And and I say this a lot. He doesn't fly in on a cape and rescue us when we're going through bad times. He allows it, lovingly allows it, because he understands that suffering and trials and tribulations, they breed something. They stir up something inside of us. They make us better. They make us more like him. And so, um, don't give the easy answer when it comes to suffering. And ready? The best answer is probably, I don't know. But tell them what you do know. That God loves them so much that he is present in our sufferings. Okay. Topic number four. Hard conversation number four. Racism. Now, a little bit of backstory, and maybe you didn't know. Um, I'm African American. Uh, And Deb is white, and we have mixed or biracial kids. And in my lifetime, I have experienced and you know racism firsthand um, on multiple occasions, and so for us, you know, knowing that you know our kids would, you know, Deb and I, you know, have been looked at, you know, kind of awkwardly and, and different, 
um, because we're an interracial couple and our kids too. So what we've explained to our kids is that um, you have to embrace, you have to hear the stories and the experiences of, of other people as they have gone and you know lived life and their experiences good and bad like you have to be able to openly hear those stories because when we can when we can sit down with people that don't look like us smell like us talk like us eat like us you know all of those they they're completely different when we can sit across from a person that they're not like us and we can listen to their story What that does is it creates um, compassion. And, and I think the, the big word here is empathy. Like we can emotionally engage in their story. And empathy is the, the, the one thing I think that we have that will actually allow us to battle and overcome racism. So allow your kids or explain to your kids, or even if you have the opportunity, get together with some people that don't look like you, smell like you, eat like you, dress like you. Maybe their hair is coarser than yours, you know, their skin's lighter than yours. It, just, it doesn't make a difference on both sides. Get together with another family and share stories and talk about them. Read in, massage that, that gift of empathy in your kids so that when they are exposed, when they're out there in the real world without you, they're all grown up and they're adulting, that they can reach back into the times where you modeled it, you set up the situation and you allowed them to empathize with other people that don't look like them racism. All right. Last one. Hard topic. Number five, God. And you're going, okay, Kenny, uh, we're all Christians here and stuff like that. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe there are people that are tuning in that aren't Christian, but, um, it's, it's not about like God, you know, you have to believe in God. That's not what I'm talking about. The conversation, the hard conversation is the conversation that we would have with our kids that would expose um, our doubts that we've had in our lifetime, in our journey with Jesus. Um, and those are some things that they're hard for us to admit. Like, you know, we don't want to go, yeah, you know, there's a season in time, you know, I love God and walked away or I had a problem or I struggled with or I didn't believe. Like, we don't want to admit those things. Those are hard things to admit. You know, again, we want to, you know, build ourselves up and, you know, the, the perception or the optics on, you know, our lives is that we're perfect and we love Jesus and, ah, you know, do anything for God, you know, like the people in scripture that God would, you know, point out, like, you know, there's a guy that he calls, you know, a man after his own heart. Um, <laughs> he was messy. His life was messy, you know, um, we can find pieces of scripture where David would, you know, like if I, if I was there and, and I picture it, it would be like, he would be like on his knees, like fist, you know, shaking at the heavens and just angry at God. It's in the Bible. But there's a moment where David, and I don't know what happens between yelling and being angry at God. And then there's this, this, this moment where I don't know if he walked away for a long time and then came back and finished the chapter or the Holy Spirit just kind of engaged and enter into his heart and reminded him who God was. Kind of bipolarish. <laughs> But it happened. God through scripture shows us that it's okay. It's okay to have doubts. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be upset. It's okay to be, you know, to have these uncertainties about 
him and your relationship with him because he has the capacity and the authority and his heart is so big and so loving towards us that when we can express those feelings, he goes, all right. And he can, the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us will then begin to remind us of who God is and how much he cares and loves us and that he's big enough to handle our doubts and our concerns and our worries and our, our anger. He's, he's big enough. He's God, for God's sake. <laughs> so the conversation, the hardest conversation, the hard conversation that, uh, that surrounds God is your doubts. Would you be willing to sit with your kids and, you know, maybe in times that they're doubting and they're uncertain to be open and honest about your doubts and your uncertainties either right now or in the past? Because again, there's, there's, uh, there's a thread here. It gives them permission to express those doubts and concerns and worries and anger towards God. But it also gives you the opportunity to talk about the loving God that we serve. And even as we doubt him, he's still God. He still cares and he still loves and he's still present. So there you have it. Five hard conversations that you should have with your kids. And here's the thing. These topics are super hard. They're super difficult taboo some of them like maybe you don't even understand how to even engage into some of them but these topics even though they're hard they're necessary they're super important that you as their parent or guardian whoever you are taking care of having the responsibility to love and care and provide for the kids that you find in your home. Like there's, it's super important that you engage in these conversations because if you don't, someone will. And that someone may give them the wrong advice. So you go first, you share, you engage, you model. Now, you're not gonna do it perfectly you're probably gonna get some things wrong. And if you do, you can always circle back and go, man, I got that wrong. That in itself models something so deep and so great for your kids to see. So go have those conversations. Will it be hard? Absolutely. But will you get through it? Will your kids love you more? Will they appreciate you more? Yep. And here's one thing that I do know is that as you engage in these hard conversations, I truly believe God is smiling and going right on. See you guys next week.